cause must always be the motivating force within the effect, for the effect could not propel itself. On this trip to date, we have seen many races very different in appearance and custom from each other. The masters see it all in the light of one consciousness. If we think of them as differing phases of consciousness, we are apt to establish for ourselves a separation from that one. The only difference is in the outer, for all are motivated by the same inner ideal, which is the Christ, or the I am God of each one. We must elevate all men from this point if we would escape the differences that appear outwardly. When this inner becomes the without, then there can be no outward difference, hence no strife, no greed, no war. There are many seeds and bulbs, but when each has fulfilled itself in outward form, it is all one harmonious nature. It is from this point of view that the masters look upon reincarnation. They say it is not necessary. It is a human hypothesis only. They say that if there is a light placed in the center of the room, the best way to reach that light is to go straight to it. Why circle around it time after time? If you go directly to that light and pick it up and incorporate it, you are through with all reincarnation and karma completely. It is only man's failure to go direct to the central point or fact of life that keeps him in the wheel of incessant grind. If he will accept that central fact, which is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, he will have arrived, and all his going round and round will have ceased. It will have come to an end. All of these great problems that afflict the minds of men are completely overcome when he lives the life of the masters or the life of his own mastery, the true inner self. Jesus' firm statement was that the truth makes you free. Man gets rid of the idea that he is not God by refusing to accept the negative statements. The statement, I am God, held habitually as a secret fact within his own nature, frees him from the negative statement that he is not God. It is always better to state the truth than the untruth. Even your ability to analyze the I am is a direct spiritual evidence of divinity. If it were not there to analyze, you would not analyze it, nor would it occur to you to even attempt an analysis. It is only necessary to accept that divinity with no ne negative thoughts or statements regarding it, to be one with it. Analyze, and all efforts to confine it to formalities keep you from it. Even in mechanics, we produce a thing and then account for it afterwards. All attempts to analyze it first only indicates its impossibility. This is true of every progressive step, even in our material advancement. How much more should this same procedure apply with things entirely beyond our present system of human reason? The airplane was never accepted as a possibility by the world until it actually flew. A first analysis said it could not fly. Now we have an infinite amount of explanation as to how and why it is so. Facts must always come first, and they may be accounted for later. If one is overly cautious and is not fully awake to himself, this may seem like laying hold of your divinity by means of blind faith, but that is not necessary. But if you take it wholly on blind faith, you have made a separation again and would never get to the gold. It is far better to say, I can, and then go right on to I am. I can is the potential fact, but I am is its fulfillment in your consciousness. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can never be that which you are not, nor can you be anything but what you are. If you can become anything, as you put it, you are that. It is really not a matter of becoming. It is a matter of being. Because you accept the I can't attitude in any condition or circumstance, you have accepted a division. Jesus said you could not compromise with sin. You cannot deviate from the fact and express that fact. 
When Jesus considered the suggestion that he turn the stones into bread, he realized that the stones were already in existence and in manifestation, and he did not need to change the stones into bread, as he could stretch forth his hand and the bread was there. What ought to be is, is the teaching of the masters. If he needed bread, he did not need to concern himself with the stones. He knew that if there was a need for bread, it was already in existence, and all he needed to do was to give thanks for it. It would be impossible for man to need anything if, he, if it were not already in existence. Could you need air if there were no such thing in existence? The need indicates the fact, and all one needs to do is to let go the sense of need and accept the fact implied in the need that it is already in existence. That which ought to be is. That is true of what we refer to as the limitation of the physical body. This is an unhypnotic influence on the mind wholly. It has no basis in fact at all. Men brought the sense of material into existence and not the body. The mortal body is the hypnotic body, and when man wakes from this state of hypnosis, all this experience will be to him just a nightmare. He wakes to dream no more. If he feels the need of a radiant spiritual body, void of limitations, and expressing the glorious light body that is his perpetual dream, that is the foreshadowing of his consciousness of his fully awakened state. The thought, the need, the desire is the evidence of the fact that such a state already exists for him and his only achievement is in accepting its existence. This ideal state is the true estate of man. This body does not need to be spiritualized. It is already spiritual, but man's false beliefs about it have shut his mind to its radiance and limitlessness. Spirit is always spirit. Man creates the materiality. There is but one body, and that body is spiritual. It is the temple of the living God, and God is in the temple. Let all the earth rejoice before God. If you call the body material, it is denying God and profaning the temple. If you call the body or any true condition material, you are denying God. You are worshiping a material condition more than you are worshiping God. That is how you get into hypnosis. The moment that you deny God, you are in a hypnotic influence. And the moment you see the body as material, you are in a hypnotic influence wherein you deny God. The body is an instrument through which to express God. It is the greatest known instrument to express spirit. It is brought here definitely for you to present God every moment, not to present materiality or hypnosis, or psychism, not to present phenomena, but to present spirit. We are God. We cannot make a separation. And if we refuse completely all separation, we would be out of all material conditions and all psychic phenomena. This is how man comes to know and understand the one presence and one power. It is all one, one power, one reality. And everything works and operates under that one power and one presence according to its own law. It is not adulterated with any other notion, but moves as itself in its own complete field. You cannot make any differentiation between the individual soul and the universal soul or the oversoul. That is, you cannot draw apart. As Jesus said, that is putting asunder God's principle. There is a generalization under which every human being works, but that, but that is an assembly of universal units. There is universal identity, but you are one in an assembly of universal units. So is every human being. All are one and the same, operating under the same harmonious conditions, always in harmony, not differentiating from harmony, but assembling in harmony. A God-man is a genius.